Here we are, Manhunt. Another jewel in Rockstar's crown of controversial games that had the media losing their shit. This time for its over-the-top and gratuitous violence that made the mayhem you could commit in GTA look outright tame. Glorifying the brutality you could commit on your enemies, the inventive executions being the game's main selling point. Both Manhunt and The Warriors happen to be the two games I have the least familiarity with out of Rockstar's library. I'll be honest, I'm pretty sure I'd never played Manhunt before this video. I knew a decent amount about its story, gameplay, and the controversy surrounding it, but that's about it. Which may explain some of the difficulty I had. Because good god, this game made me feel so inept I started questioning my abilities as a gamer. It's not even a difficulty thing either. I've definitely played tougher games for the channel, but it took me much longer than it should have to get a grasp of the game's mechanics. Once I overcame the hurdle that is my own stupidity, it all started to click. Is this game just an edgy murder simulator like the media would have you believe? Or is there more to the game than just the violence you're expected to commit? Well, let's hop in and find out. It looks like this goes all the way to the top. I can't trust anyone, least of all the police, and time's running out. I've got to get the one piece of evidence that will expose Starkweather without a shadow of a doubt. Footage and testimony of a man who was executed by the state five hours ago. James Earl Cash. Ugh. Found guilty and sentenced to death. Has been on death row for the past three years and was executed last night. Set in the crime-ridden hellhole known as Carcer City, the game opens up with the news covering the execution of death row inmate James Earl Cash. Despite seemingly being killed by lethal injection, it was actually a sedative, as Cash wakes up sometime later far from the prison and locked in a room. Hey, tough guy, wake up. You're not dead. Well, not yet, anyway. You're getting a second chance. Another throw of the dice. As far as the world is concerned, you died back in the chamber. Justice was served. James Earl Cash is rotting in <sighs> If that voice over the radio sounds familiar, that's because it belongs to Brian Cox, a veteran actor with a ton of big movies under his belt, probably best known as of late for playing Logan Roy in Succession. To me, though, I know him best as Captain O'Hagan and Super Troopers, and of course, Colonel William Stryker and X2 X-Men United. I didn't realize Xavier was taken in animals, even animals as unique as you. Who are you? Don't you remember? In my opinion, still the best X-Men movie. Yeah, Days of Future Past is good too, but I don't know. X2 just holds up so well all these years later. And before anyone says it, Logan is a Wolverine movie, not an X-Men movie. Cox plays the director, our man on the radio who promises to give Cash his freedom, but only if he follows the director's instructions. Released into a decrepit neighborhood patrolled by other criminals, the death row inmate will have to slaughter his way through or else end up killed by the scum hunting him. While at first it may seem that you're the participant of some kind of death game, in actuality Cash has become the new star of the director's latest snuff movie, forced to commit gruesome acts of violence, not just for survival, but for the sick thrills of the director and his clientele. Everything about the game's design leans heavily into this snuff movie motif, from the cutscenes and executions looking like they were filmed from the point of view of a VHS camcorder, or local CCTV footage, to the game's main menu looking more like a DVD menu, with levels referred to as scenes and laid out the same way scenes are organized on a movie disc. Even the game's manual acts more as a video catalog advertising the snuff films made by Valiant Video Enterprises, the company run by our friend the director. One aspect of Manhunt that deserves praise is its effective utilization of the VHS camcorder aesthetic. Not only does it skillfully recreate the vintage VHS appearance, but it also goes a step further by altering the perspective, immersing you in the sensation of being on camera or under surveillance by a nearby security system. Too many modern indie horror games will use the VHS look as a filter to slap onto the gameplay, but it doesn't really add to the horror or feel like I'm being filmed. Truthfully, it often feels like a lazy option that adds no significant value to the gaming experience. This opening level serves as our usual tutorial, with the director guiding us through the gameplay features. Manhunt's gameplay heavily focuses on stealth, 
Your goal to stay out of sight and kill your hunters before they can fight back. You need to get your hands on a weapon first, then sneak up on an unaware enemy and send them off to hell. That's it. No more tears, only dreams now. The game will give you a variety of options to dispatch the scum you can encounter, from things like plastic bags and shards of glass, to more traditional weapons like a crowbar, machete, or baseball bat, and later on in the game, an assortment of guns. Weapons are broken down into color-coded tiers that signify their effectiveness and use. Green weapons are one-offs that you lose after an execution, usually found laying around in a level. Blue weapons can be used multiple times and are typically held by the hunters searching for you. Red weapons are the strongest and loudest, being the most effective when you find yourself in normal combat. There are also yellow weapons that, while you can't kill someone with them, can instead be used to lure an enemy to a location. Once you have a weapon and catch someone slipping, it's fairly easy to pull off an execution, just requiring you to press X or square while locked on and standing behind them. Then you'll be treated to a gruesome animation of Cash killing that poor schlub. To keep things from getting too boring, and adding variety to all your various executions, you have the option to perform higher tiered and gorier kills. By holding down the attack button longer as you prepare to kill someone, the reticle around your target will change color. Yellow for violent executions, and red for gruesome ones. This will give you a different and more drawn out kill, and increasing the rating you receive at the end of a level. The trade off being you risk being caught if you wait too long to kill someone. You can also make use of your fists as a last resort if you don't have a weapon, but you can't perform an execution, so you're stuck killing someone the old fashioned way, beating them to death. Though hunters won't stand there and eat an ass whooping, they will throw hands and try to fight back. And trust me, you don't want them to fight back as traditional combat in the game is clunky as all hell. Unlike the Warriors or Bully, it plays out very slowly and doesn't use combos, instead relying on light and heavy attacks, trading blows with an opponent until one of you dies. You can lock onto someone and block too, but blocking requires you not to be pressing the attack button at all, which doesn't feel intuitive in the least, and sometimes won't block anyways. Since there isn't a pattern you need to learn or the option for a counter or parry, even when you win, you'll end up losing a ton of health, so you'll need to seek out some painkillers lying around to heal up. But if you're fighting more than one guy at once, well prepare to die, as it's basically impossible to survive as they'll constantly interrupt your attacks. Outside of a few mandatory encounters, if you get spotted by an enemy, your best course of action is to run until you can lose them and hide in the shadows. A lesson that took me so much longer to learn than it really should have. While I'd normally be way more critical of combat this sloppy, here, it's kind of the point, as if you could just punch your way through every encounter, you'd never feel incentivized to participate with the stealth and executions. Now, navigating around and getting the drop on the hunters after you isn't the easiest thing in the world, mostly because you're not fully aware of their locations. You have a minimap, but it's less a map and more like a radar, as it would only show nearby enemies and only the ones making some kind of noise. Idle enemies who aren't aware of your presence are colored yellow walking around their usual set path. Enemies marked orange are suspicious of your presence, either because they heard a sound or lost sight of you after they gave chase. Typically, they'll hang around an area looking around for you, often walking an erratic path near you and turning around frequently, making it easy for them to spot you if you don't execute them fast enough. And finally, enemies marked in red are fully aware of your presence. They'll give chase, call out for help, and you can't hide from them unless you break line of sight and get far enough away. Since you're not always aware of your enemy's locations, you want to make sure to move slowly and peek around walls before proceeding into an unknown area. Playing cautiously is key, as hunters can hear you sprinting if they're nearby, but sometimes you'll want to move even slower than usual, as certain levels have gravel or some other substance on the ground that make noise when walking over it. That said, you don't have to wait in the shadows forever waiting for the right opportunity to proceed as you can use sound to your advantage to bring enemies to you. Like I mentioned before, you can throw certain objects as distractions, but you can also hit weapons against a wall to make a sound and bring someone to you. Since levels tend to be pretty long, with different areas and objectives to complete, mastering the mechanics will help you get through faster. If you're new or unfamiliar with the game like I am, some of these levels can really drag until you've got the mechanics down, but thankfully you don't have to complete a level in one go as there are videotapes spread out that double as both checkpoints and save points, letting you pick up your progress if you had to stop playing for whatever reason. 
or if the game locked itself because it couldn't read the license for it, like it did for me on my PS4. Proceeding through the tutorial and killing more gang members, we'll end up in a dilapidated mall, and the only way out is a garbage chute being guarded by a hood. Oh, and when I say hood, I don't mean shorthand for hoodlum, as the criminals we encounter in this level, and some of the following levels, are all part of a gang known as the Hoods. And he guesses why they call them that? As we advance through the game, Cash finds himself navigating various locations that have been overrun by different enemy factions. While each group has a unique look to them, lines of dialogue and weapons, you'll still be taking them down the same for the most part. Only a few objectives in some later levels forcing you to change up your approach. Here, before we're able to leave, we need to lure the guard blocking the exit and kill him so the director will unlock the way out. Now you don't have to kill every single enemy you see, but there will be times where the director forces you to clear out an area before you can move on. So despite the heavy focus on stealth, there isn't a real pacifist option. Not only that, but the director will be rating you on your performance. As he frequently encourages you to kill someone, praises you when it's particularly gruesome, but at the same time will get frustrated if you stand around for too long, and outright bored if you repeat the same weapon executions. After completing a level or scene, you're rated on your performance on a 5 star scale. Though you can only get the full 5 stars if you're playing on hardcore mode. If you're playing on fetish, the highest you'll ever get is 4 stars. You'll earn 1 star by completing a scene under a given time, the other 3 given to you as style points. Which is determined by how many executions you pull off, the type of executions, and the weapon variety used. You're not required to reach a score to pass but getting at least 3 stars will unlock concept art, and getting 3 stars in several levels will unlock bonus levels. If you play in hardcore mode, getting 5 stars in each scene will unlock pieces of a cheat code that you can use when fully unlocked. While I'm glad I wasn't forced to perform well in order to proceed, I'd be lying if I didn't admit seeing how long it took me to finish a couple levels didn't hurt my gamer pride. So I may or may not have gone back to replace some levels after I was done recording, in order to redeem myself a bit. You're doing fine, Cash. Just fine. We're getting some great material here. Keep going. Exiting the garbage chute, we end up in an abandoned alley, and after killing more hoods and making our way through an abandoned house, we end up at a locked gate. Unfortunately, my mini bat isn't enough to bust through the padlock, so I'll need to find a different weapon instead. This is where I first really stumbled while playing as I fell right into the developer's trap and let myself get intimidated by this place. It's a big open area, with several hoods patrolling it and one guarding the entrance into a building. It's not immediately obvious where you're supposed to go, so you'll most likely assume what you're looking for is in the building with the guard. But that's not the case, because if you take the alley to get around the guard and then get the drop on him, it turns out the building didn't have what you were looking for. All you're rewarded with is a larger and stronger bat you can loot off them. Your actual objective is an entrance near the back of the alley. This large and mostly empty area was really there just to throw you off and waste your time. Something the game does a lot with its levels. While there are times where you're rewarded for exploration, mostly with painkillers and occasionally a weapon, more often than not, the wrong way is just a dead end. It's a great way to mess with the player's head keep them constantly apprehensive about what's the right way to go, and what could possibly be waiting for them around a corner. To the game's credit, there are some various obvious ways to go, as you'll occasionally find riding on the wall or arrows pointing you in the right direction. Entering the correct building, I find where the crowbar I need is supposed to be, but some hood already nabbed it and was waiting for me. After cracking his head open and taking the crowbar, I run back to the game only to get blindsided, as a new enemy was waiting for me. Since I had cleared out everyone in the area already, I thought I was in the clear and dropped my guard as I sprinted towards the gate, and ended up getting spotted by this guy. So that's another lesson the game teaches us. Even if you know where to go, or cleared out all your threats, never assume you're really safe. Even being able to unlock the gate doesn't guarantee smooth sailing as it takes a few seconds to pry open and makes a lot of noise, attracting anyone nearby. Reaching the end of the level, Cash enters a blood-soaked basement and is forced into another mandatory combat encounter. <laughs> okay, this is what I like to call a setup. This guy will fight dirty, but once you're through with him, I'll open the next door. 
It's meant to teach us how to grapple and how to break free when we're grabbed. But for the life of me, I don't think I ever tried grabbing someone in combat. It really is just better to keep swinging at them while carefully walking backwards to avoid getting hit. Beginning of the next level, it's fairly straightforward at first, as the first two hunters you encounter are easily taken down by luring them in with sound. Running down the alley, another hunter will spring from the shadows to attack Cash, forcing a combat encounter. Healing up before proceeding, you can hear a hunter walking around up ahead, but no matter what you do, you can't lure him to ya. Like the last one, you have to proceed and force another combat encounter. And Christ, this guy really showed how inept I was in combat, as I screwed up this encounter with him several times and kept dying. This one level embarrassed me with how badly I did it, as it took me a solid 40 minutes to complete, when a half-decent player could easily do it in under 10. It's easy to make the excuse that I'm new to the game and learning the mechanics, but I don't know. I just kept screwing up the simplest things or approaching encounters in the most obtuse ways. While I did get better as I went through the game, I think my problem was forgetting all the tools I had at my disposal. Too many times I could have solved the problem easier and faster if I remembered I could lure enemies with sound, or that it's best to run and hide instead of treating getting spotted like it was a death sentence. Proceeding to the next area, I have to reach the cellar beneath the library, but the gate is being guarded. I lure the guy away by throwing a brick, and then remind him why we need biodegradable plastics, and then distract the two guys who find his body. Instead of picking him off though, I run to the unguarded gate, break the lock, and breathe a sigh of relief as I hit the checkpoint. After spending just a little too much time in the cellar, and trying to lure the guys blocking the exit into traps, I finally escaped only to take a punch to the face when the game locked up on me in the end level cutscene. It wasn't a crash though, just that stupid license check thing I mentioned before. For the life of me, I can't seem to get that sorted out. Despite playing on my primary PS4 and restoring my licenses, I always get that stupid notification that an application will close in 15 minutes because it can't verify a license. Maybe my internet connection is just trash or something, I don't know. Thankfully, after booting up the game, it did save my progress, and I didn't have to redo the level again. Get ready boys, he's coming. Despite being done with the hoods and escaping the area, Cash gets ambushed by some kind of black ops group who knock him out and toss him into their van. The following cutscene shows some military guy giving out orders to a new gang the Skins, who are composed of neo-Nazis. He instructs them to put on a show for someone named Starkweather, which happens to be the real identity of our friend the director. When Cash comes to, he's been dumped in the junkyard area where the Skins are prowling. Unfortunately, this whole ordeal is far from over. While Cash was napping, he was stripped of all the weapons he previously had, so we're back to square one against these new guys. Sneaking into the junkyard, we'll eventually run into another locked gate though this time it's using rope instead of a padlock, which requires us to find something sharp like a knife or machete in order to unlock it and get through. As we get further into the game, some levels will mix and match the type of lock gates they have, often needing you to memorize and backtrack where you drop the right weapon. There's a nail gun in that trailer, if you can stand the smell. Reaching a trailer, we're given a chance to get our first long range weapon, the nail gun. Tossing a brick through the window, I lure the guy inside taking a shit outside to his doom and nab it. It's amazing how much combat changes once you get your hand on this thing, as while you need ammo for it, the weapon's lock-on is super generous, giving you an easy headshot when close enough to an enemy. The only trade-off is you can't use it to execute enemies, so your style points at the end of a level will suffer if you abuse it to kill enemies. Arriving at an electronic gate, you have to take a detour to find the switch and unlock the gate to proceed into the next level. These skins are boring me, you dumbass supremacist bastards. Always blaming others for their inadequacies. Butcher them, Cash. Cut them up. Beat them down and choke the fucking life out of them. You know, there's something kind of funny of Starkweather encouraging Cash to kill these guys because they're Nazis. Like the skins being criminals, Actively hunting and trying to kill him wasn't enough justification. Them being big old racists. That's the little push this death row inmate needs to keep killing. Oh, I'm a sleazeball paying criminals to commit horrific acts of violence and murder to sell and film to others. 
But at least I'm not a racist. I don't think Starkweather really cares if someone is racist or not. It's just a way to downplay his own horrible acts. Proceeding forward, I need to once again pick off all the guards so Starkweather will unlock the next gate. Next, we'll need to lure this guard away from his post, shutting off the power and turning off his porn. This shit seems content to watch porn and avoid all the action if he won't switch it off himself. We'll have to do it for him. Forcing him to come check it out so I can end him. In order to enter the next area, we'll need to make use of this magnetic crane but have to find fuel for it first. Luckily, we don't have to go too far to find it. No, the tough part is getting it back to the crane. Hitting the save point and grabbing the fuel, more guards will spawn on the way back. On top of that, the fuel canister is heavy and prevents you from using your weapons until you put it down. So it's a short loop of moving the canister as far as you can, dropping it to kill a guard, picking it up again, and proceeding forward until you reach the next guard. Fueling up the crane, you can now move the fridge blocking your path. But the sound of heavy machinery attracts every enemy in the area. You're now locked into an awkward combat sequence where you need to drop and drag the fridge around in order to kill the skins who are opening fire on you with nail guns. Due to the camera angle and the weird physics of the magnet on the fridge, it can be tough to accurately hit enemies. So chances are you won't always land a direct hit and we'll need to repeatedly slam the fridge against someone. Continuing forward, our next objective is to find the crusher machine. But before we can get there, we have another gate that Starkweather refuses to unlock until we clear the area of hunters. Entering another crane, it's more fridge dragging shenanigans. Wouldn't it make more sense to get up close to shoot him so we can avoid the crane? No one asked you to think. Shut up and stay the course, Jerry. Dropping one final guard at the exit, we're home free. Except not really, as we're ambushed by the same group from earlier and knocked unconscious again. We'll then get an ominous cutscene of those same group of men dealing with what I can only describe as some sort of horrible pig monster. Sure hope we never have to fight that guy. Getting dumped at the zoo, we're up against a new group. This time it's the militaristic war dogs. Despite looking and supposedly acting like an armed militia, the war dogs don't behave any differently from the previous groups. Sneaking up on one of them and taking his breath away, I help myself to his machete. The machete is quite handy, not only for being able to cut through ropes, but also for letting me lop off the heads of these clowns, becoming an equitable item I can throw for distractions. This opening area of the zoo is very large and a bit confusing to navigate, as a lot of paths will loop back on each other, with several hunters patrolling with their routes often intersecting each other. This guarantees you'll end up attracting several of them if you end up getting spotted. Unsurprisingly, the way out is locked down, but Starkweather is kind enough to offer a hint to the location of the crowbar we need. Where did I hide that crowbar? Think! 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 Sorry, Cash. This is a grisly situation. The bastard hid it in the bear exhibit, which, despite the confusing nature of this area, is easy enough to find thanks to this bear poster. And despite how funny and awesome it would be to get into a fight with a bear for a crowbar, instead it's just some regular guy guarding it. This next area offers a unique encounter, as the path leading to the end of the level is being guarded by a war dog with a tranquilizer rifle. His shots won't kill Cash, but it will leave him woozy and unable to use his weapons. Easy pickings for any other hunters alerted to our location. After picking off the roaming war dogs, I entered into an awkward game of cat and mouse, trying my best to get the drop on the guy with the gun. After failing to distract him long enough so I can sneak up on him, and somehow missing him with a brick at point blank range, I got creative and tried charging at him instead. It went as well as expected. But by pure stupid luck, I pushed him off his post, so after losing his aggro and getting back to the door, I was able to unlock it before he caught up. I didn't get to pat myself on the back for long, as I had two more war dogs to deal with who were in front of yet another locked door. Like I said earlier, never assume you're safe and in the clear until you actually beat the level. 
Luring them to the bathroom and taking them out, I was finally done with this level. Ugh, look at how long this took me. At least I got an achievement. Hold up, Cash. You and your family weren't exactly close, am I right? It's just that I thought it would be nice to have a surprise reunion. But these war dogs didn't see it my way, and they've taken matters into their own hands. They're using them as bait, Cash. Bait! I know! I know! I can hardly believe it myself. Each time they spot you, these war dogs are gonna execute one of your beloved family. With our family kidnapped, this level shakes up things considerably, as we have to complete the level with at least one of our family members saved, as if all four of them die, you'll instantly fail. To make things even more difficult, your save points are spread out very far in this level. In fact, the first one doesn't pop up until halfway through the level when you reach the third hostage. This means you have to play even more cautiously, otherwise you'll have to go through the process of saving your first two hostages all over again if you blow it and die. Despite what Starkweather said in the cutscene, you won't instantly fail if you're spotted, only if the war dogs with a gun see you, as they'll run back to their hostage and execute them. This first family member is easy enough to save, as you can lure his guard outside with sound and then kill him for his trusty revolver. It only has a few rounds on it until you find ammo, but it has more stopping power than the nail gun, and can easily pull off headshots, though since it's, you know, an actual gun, it's very loud and will attract any nearby hunters to you when fired. Get out of here! Run! Wait, Cash can talk? Like he was making some grunting sounds when he was first grabbed, and was trying to bust through the locked door, but I just assumed he was a silent protagonist like Claude in GTA 3? Why was he so quiet until now? Like, why didn't he ask Starkweather who he was or what he was doing with them after faking his execution? This isn't really a criticism I have. Honestly, considering modern games have their characters constantly talking for fear of boring the player, I actually prefer the restraint Manhunt has. It just feels weird. Like, if he spoke at the beginning, and had been mostly quiet afterwards, you could assume that's just how Cash is and he's focused on survival. Having him speak several hours in-game out of nowhere almost feels like the devs flip-flopped on whether to make him a silent protagonist or not. After saving Cash's brother, or dad, or whatever relative that guy was supposed to be, it's a long slog to the second hostage. First, we cross a large construction site with several guards, including one with a tranquilizer rifle, then down a long winding path and stairs, careful to bait out the executor before we're in the clear to save the next hostage, who might be Cash's wife, or sister, or daughter, who knows. Finally reaching the save point, peering through the boards, we could see a war dog in the next room guarding the third hostage. I was trying my best to line up a shot and take him out, but I blew it and alerted him to my presence, though thankfully he came to me instead of killing my relative. So I pulled a Freddy Krueger and killed that bastard in his sleep after tranquilizing him. Okay, you're okay. Go! Good luck and stay safe, unnamed male relative. Please don't tell anyone I'm not actually dead. Starkweather is kind enough to show us the way out and the location of the next save point. Unfortunately, we can only go through Jaw's mouth by saving the last hostage. Since she's the only important one, I could have just abandoned the rest of them. But, you don't turn your back on family. After another long slog of killing war dogs, I eventually make it to an unnamed female relative and set her free. The shark's mouth unlocked, I head inside, take out some more war dogs, pull the switch to unlock the exit, and just make a run towards freedom and ignore the last two guys the game springs on me. Unsurprisingly, we're once again captured. Cash, so used to it by this point, he doesn't even bother to fight back. So, how are we doing, Cash? Enjoying it so far? I thought you could do with a little R&R, &R, so I've arranged a special screening. Just for you. It's work in progress, but I think you'll appreciate it. I've hidden a tape and a video camera in the mall. Find them. Arriving at an abandoned mall, the next group of ragtag misfits we'll be up against are the Innocents which seems to be made up of Latino gangbangers and guys cosplaying as the Phantasm from Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. 
Starkweather has recorded something special for Cash, as thanks for helping him with his film business, tasking us with finding the videotape in a camcorder. This level is considerably different from the previous ones, as stealth is all but abandoned, instead turning into a standard shooting level. From this point forward, the game will lean more and more into action set pieces, with lesser focus on the stealth and executions. I'll touch on this subject more towards the end, but I don't necessarily consider it a bad thing, partially because this is when the game was getting easier for me, and stealth is still pretty important, especially in the last few levels where the overwhelming number of enemies you're up against means you can't just brute force your way through. Since you're not really given any opportunities to get the drop on the innocents, this entire level plays out like your usual GTA mission, though you can hide behind walls and crouch beneath objects, peek around cover to take your shots, and can make use of manual aim to try for headshots from farther away. Any encounters with multiple enemies pretty much guarantee you'll take a couple shots, so as you advance you'll want to make sure your health is topped off. Best practice when it comes to these shootouts is to count their shots. As enemies stop to reload after taking 6 shots if they're carrying a revolver or a pistol. Once you know their clip is empty, you can just run in for an easy headshot and save some ammo. After running around the mall to find the videotape and camera, then turning on the power in a bar so I can use its TV, Cash can finally see the surprise Starkweather had for him. You must understand, Cash. I could never have let her go. <laughs> your family when you were facing your final moments in the chamber anyway. You've left your old life, your old self behind. I'm all the family you need now. All that effort spent being as careful as possible to save my family, and they still ended up dead. While it only shows one of them dying, it's implied he killed the rest of them too. Kidnapping Cash and forcing him to play Starkweather's sick games was one thing, but killing his unnamed relatives? That's going too far. Uh, look at that score. First time I actually had a good handle on what I was doing. Please ignore the fact this level was considerably easier because stealth wasn't required. Well, what do you think of your new friend? You look good together, Cash. Really, you do. I'll only open any gates if he's with you, alive and well. Now, get going. If murdering our family wasn't enough, Starkweather forces the worst type of video game mission onto us next, an escort mission, as we now have to keep this drunk hobo alive and get him to the end of the level in order to proceed. Thankfully, this is probably one of the simplest and most forgiving escort missions I've ever played. For one, the tramp has a health bar, so he could take a few hits before dying, but more importantly, he can hide in the shadows like you. So, the best course of action is to lead him to a shadow, have him stay put, kill anyone up ahead, and then go back for him when the coast is clear. Honestly, while it took a while, our journey through the streets, an abandoned subway, and finally a graveyard, wasn't too bad. It was only the very end where any difficulty popped up, as the patrolling innocents are all packing shotguns, but by ambushing one and taking their piece for myself, I was able to shoot my way through. Kind of odd that Starkweather had us escort some random hobo. You'd think it would have made more sense to have it be one of our family members after freeing them. Apparently, during the planning stages for Manhunt, there was this gang leader named Scarecrow, who fell out of favor with Starkweather and became a bum. So the original scenario for this escort mission would have had you bring the tramp to the end of the level, where he'd find his old outfit and reawaken to his old persona, possibly ending the level with some kind of boss fight. Don't know why it was cut. Maybe they couldn't flesh it out properly or ran out of time. Or maybe they didn't want to frustrate the player with a surprise boss fight at the end of what can be a long and tedious level. Time for a little overtime. Make your way through the factory. The loading bay is your only way in. The following level leans back into just shooting, as we have to fight our way through a factory occupied by the innocents. First, killing a few of them outside to reach a guard post, and unlock the door leaning inside. Then, gunning down more of them as I activate a switch to take a lift up to the next floor. This walkway is where I ran into some trouble, as you're completely exposed and your position will be given away the second you're spotted or open fire. 
After John wicking my way through the area and totally not getting myself killed because I blew it when running away, I finally reached a factory reception area and escape. And as always, my group of friends show up to drive me to the next location. The senator also visited the Darkwoods Penitentiary, which hosts more than a thousand inmates from all over the country. The prison's modern facilities include spacious cells for the inmates. The exceptionally well-staffed hospital is equipped for emergencies, as well as routine health checks. Adjacent to row one, the electric chair room is where death sentences are carried out. Our next stop is the prison where Cash was locked up in and was supposed to be executed at. The inmates are running the asylum. As the prisoners escaped, killed the prison staff, and formed the gang known as the Smileys. When it came to Manhunt back in the day, these guys are all I remember, as they were used for most of the advertising of the game. Like I mentioned before, I'm pretty sure I didn't play the game, but I remember seeing these guys in ads for the game in gaming magazines, and for the commercials they aired at the time. Outside our usual killings, Starkweather wants Cash to murder a criminal in a dress, located at the prison guard tower, and then bring his body to the guard room to proceed. Thankfully, he's like right next to the guard room, so I don't have to worry about hauling his body around all level. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, but you can pick up and hide the bodies of anyone you kill. It's not as sophisticated as in a game like Hitman, where you can stuff someone in a closet or something. You just drop a body in the shadows or out of view. Honestly, I never felt the need to hide a body, as the linear design of most levels made it rare that a hunter would stumble upon their dead buddies. And the few times it did happen, it worked as a good distraction, either letting me kill them or just sneaking past. My goal is clear, the first order of business is to get this guy to unlock the door so I can kill him and get past. Which I accomplish by electrocuting this other guy and ambushing the guard when he comes to investigate and turn off the switch. Then I turn it back on to finish the first guy. Don't know what his deal is, but I'm going to blindly assume he's a horrible criminal and send his ass to hell. Cutting through the prison yard and ending up in what looks like an old and rundown greenhouse, Starkweather tips me off I need to get through a tower in order to proceed. But the geniuses who are occupying it blocked my only way inside by completely bricking up the entrance. So I'll need to improvise a way to get inside, which I accomplish by finding a fuel canister, placing it in front of the tower, and shooting it to cause an explosion. Climbing the tower, I unlock the door to leave, make my way through the other side of the prison until I reach the rooftop, find and kill my target, and lug his ass to the exit. There's a good boy. Now, drop all your weapons and move on. After willingly dropping all our weapons, we're back to a more traditional level, as Starkweather wants us to take it slow and perform for the camera again. Cash will wander the dark and abandoned prison cells, finding what appears to be the remains of some of the prison staff, until stumbling upon the hammer he needs to use. For the first and only time in the game, we're now required to pull off a violent and gruesome execution if we want to proceed. I gotta tell ya, I completely forgot about this mechanic until I got to this point in my playthrough, as outside my first kill in the game, I never tried the higher tiered executions, which, on top of taking forever to do anything, is why most of my end level scores have been so pitiful. Smileys will now drop into the area to give us something to kill, and will spawn endlessly until we get the required executions. Alrighty then, it's hammer time. Though, not enough for our perverted and sadistic director, as we have to kill a hunter for his bat and pull off some executions with it too. Let's see, do I have any good baseball puns? Eh, screw it. I'm Batman. Execution quota met. He'll unlock the door to the next area and give us a much needed save point. It's shooting time again, but we won't get far on the next floor before getting shot to pieces. Luckily, that's where Fug comes in. Look like a Dr. Fug. Fug. 
as we can smash in his dome and arm ourselves with his revolver before going upstairs. It's a slow process making my way through this cell block as most of the inmates will stay put and hide behind the mattresses they're using for cover. So I have to trade shots with them or bum rush them when they're reloading so I can just get that easy headshot, grab their ammo, and use their cover for myself. You're my big ugly Alice, so go on, follow the white rabbit. Starting the next level, Starkweather orders us to chase after an inmate dressed as a rabbit. Our way to him is blocked when a separate inmate locks the door, and then frees all his buddies to attack us. Thankfully, since I wasn't stripped of my weapons, these chumps with melee weapons are cannon fodder against my shotgun. Chasing the white rabbit and continuing my journey deeper into this deranged wonderland, I'll eventually lose sight of him, but Starkweather instructs me to head up to the watch room to find a gift he gave me. Though I need to take care of this guy in the dress first, the cutscene and the way he's just standing out in the open made me think there was some kind of trick to this guy or he'd be tough to kill, but I just slowly crept against the wall on the right, hid in the shadow when he spotted me, and then just one-tapped him. Reaching the room above, the white rabbit did actually leave us a gift, some shotgun shells, which I put to immediate use by popping the heads of the death row inmates trying to rush me. It's around this time I realized that Starkweather deliberately wanted us to feel overpowered, not just to get easy footage of us taking out the prisoners like flies, but to lure us into a false sense of security to spring a trap in the workshop. You made it! Oh dear, you see, you didn't make it after all! <laughs> what can I say? You are a good leading man. The audience will love you. Don't expect any royalty checks where you're going. The White Rabbit escaping. Starkweather no longer has any use for cash, sicking a bunch of his prisoners packing their own boob sticks to finish him off. Unfortunately, he probably should have hired some professionals, as I was able to safely run to take cover and then pick each of them off one by one. I'm not even hiding or using stealth. These idiots are just standing around in the open and don't even try to come after me. Picking up the corpse of one of my would-be assassins, I drop him on the pressure plate that unlocks the gate out of here. You're supposed to be dead! Oh fuck! He's after my freaking key! Chasing the white rabbit outside, the black ops group who I've been running into all game are waiting for me. No kidnapping this time though. They straight up want me dead. I forget when it's brought up in the story, but these guys are a mercenary group known as Cerberus, who are basically Starkweather's personal little army. I'll have to fight my way through them to get to the white rabbit and get the gate key I need to escape. Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting weapons. More Cerberus mercenaries will arrive to try and finish me off, but by ambushing the ones dumb enough to run up the stairs and using a sniper rifle to pick off the rest, I managed to escape and end the level. Where do you think you're going? Think you're tough? Think you're tough? I'll rip your fucking head off! Our newfound freedom is short-lived though, as Starkweather seeks the leader of the war dogs on us, Ramirez. Despite the fact he ambushed Cash, beat his ass, and took his weapons, Ramirez doesn't finish the job and decides to play with Cash instead, choosing to hunt him with his fellow war dogs. Needless to say, that's going to prove a very costly mistake for Sagat here. Sticking to the shadows, I slowly start picking off the war dogs outside, getting my hands on one of their machetes. Ramirez will send more of his men out to search for cash, who all just so happen to be strapped with shotguns. After taking care of those losers and getting locked and loaded, I enter his main stronghold and start ascending each floor searching for the bastard. Slaughtering his men and reaching the top floor, Ramirez pops out of a room behind me and makes a run for it. I now have two and a half minutes to chase after and put him in the ground before he calls in backup to help. War dogs will spring out of rooms and around corners to try and slow me down, but eventually I catch up to Ramirez outside and blow his brains out. Finishing the level and escaping, we make a new friend and get to hear Cash's lovely voice again. Get in, you idiot! Get in! 
Pull over. Pull over. Who are you? I've seen your face before. Get off of me. I'm a reporter. I was at your execution. Hey, I remember her. She was the one who reported on Cash's execution at the beginning of the game. The journalist, yeah, that's just what the game calls her and she doesn't have a name, needs to get to her apartment to gather the evidence she has to expose Starkweather. Unfortunately, the director has the chief of police on his payroll. And the cops are now swarming the area looking to kill her and Cash. It's an escort mission like we did with the Tramp. The only difference is that April O'Neil here will freak out and leave cover if we wander too far from her. It's not really an issue though, as the level has plenty of shadowy spots you can park her ass in, so there's never a need to go too far without her. After navigating the streets, picking off the boys in blue, and getting strapped again, we reach the journalist's apartment which is swarming with more cops. You can lure a few of them downstairs to pick them off from the shadows, but the rest stay put and won't poke their heads out of the apartment. The best way to proceed without getting turned into Swiss cheese is to run in, kill the closest one, run away back downstairs, wait for them to lose track of you, and then do it again. Everything I need is in that box under the table. Good. Take it and get out of town. But you're not coming with me? I'm going to deal with Starkweather personally. Thank him for my second chance. You're my backup if I don't make it. Have a nice life. Saying goodbye to the journalist, Cash has his sights set on settling the score with Starkweather. Heading back down into the streets, before we can proceed we have to deal with a police sniper up on the second floor of the casino. After getting into the building, taking out the officers inside, and finally the sniper, we clear out more cops on the streets, ascend a building to take out a second sniper, and finally finish off the guy guarding the entrance into the subway. We're still not in the clear though, as the cops are still after us and have turned off the power to the subway, preventing our escape. This is a considerably harder level than before, as it's very big and confusing to navigate. You can be killed in seconds due to the increase in cops and lack of cover. And worst of all, even the shadows can't help you for long. As the police and SWAT chasing you have flashlights equipped into their shotguns, so they'll actively search the shadows when looking for you. Clearing the cops on the train platform, I run down the tracks and spot a group of enemies heading my way. I duck into the shadows to ambush one, hide in the shadows again as the other cops circle around towards me. I make a run for it down to the end of the tracks and hit the save point. This area is the toughest to navigate as there are several cops patrolling the hallway and pretty much all of them will swarm me the second you engage one of them. After several tries, I just go for it, making a left, taking some fire but killing the two cops here before passing through the door into a different side of train rails. Narrowly escaping the cops searching for me, I head back where I came and sneak into the control room, managing to get the drop on the cop inside and hitting the switch. This will alert more police to my presence, but finding a shadow in the corner of the room, I wait for them and ambush anyone who comes in. This is just the cliff notes by the way, as this took several tries and a lot of experimenting after many, many deaths. Running back to the start of the level, I board the subway car, but things are far from over as I'll now have to ascend this new subway station swarming with even more cops. Thankfully, you're given a save point as soon as you step off the subway, and this second half is considerably easier, as you can bait cops into following you and can pick off some of them by slowly ascending the stairs before they spot you. Well, that can't be good. Not our problem though. I'm sure those Cerberus guys will put down that pig monster. Popping up in a train yard, Carcer City's finest have the place completely locked down. So it's going to require some real work getting through here. We do have some places where we can hide and pick up a crowbar to use for a more silent approach. But it's still not easy. Mostly because of the overwhelming number of enemies. And how many of them have overlapping patrol routes. So trying to lure someone close to the shadows with the sound will usually lure several cops, making it much tougher to take them out one at a time. There's also several cops stationed between the only path to the other side of the train yard, so you're pretty much forced into firefights whether you like it or not. Ultimately, I kind of just pulled a Leroy Jenkins, headshotting anyone I saw and running as far ahead of them as I could before they gave up or I managed to hide. 
After climbing a train car and reaching the save point, I need to run across several cars and into the final part of the yard where the exit is. The game still refuses to make it easy for us though, as most of the cops here are equipped with submachine guns and will tear you to pieces if you're spotted and run. So I pulled a cheeky maneuver, as if you stay on top of the final train car instead of jumping off of it, you can lure the enemies on the other side to you, pick them off, and avoid all their fire. Finally, freedom! Nothing can stop me now. Put your fucking hands up! Shoot that top killer, son of a bitch! Guys, you saved me. We really are friends after all. to comment on these allegations. At this point, it is unclear as to whether or not he will ever be allowed to direct again. This is... Looks like April O'Neil managed to expose Starkweather. Too bad Cerberus is ready to end us. You know what? I don't give a fuck what Starkweather wants. Maybe today I kill you. Maybe not. Kill the camera. Whoa. Whoa. Big D. Or not, as we're spared a bullet to the brain as Cerberus have a much bigger threat on their hands. Pigsy. He's the strange obese man with a pig mask we've seen pop up from time to time throughout the game. Pigsy is an animalistic mass murderer, a former star in Starkweather's movies, until he proved too difficult to control and the director had him chained up. Now he's free, is on the prowl with a chainsaw, cutting through Cerberus troops like butter, and... Uh, imagine the last thing you saw was this deranged serial killer's dong just before he cut you to pieces. Left alone in the garage, I wander around in circles trying to figure out what to do, till I realize I'm supposed to hit this switch to open the garage. Killing the Cerberus goon who comes inside to check. I grab his piece and start making my way to Starkweather's estate. Navigating the area, I find what's left of the poor bastards who ran into Pigsy. Not sure how an elite mercenary group with guns and body armor are being decimated by one obese naked guy with a chainsaw, but maybe they've never seen a horror movie and decided to split up instead of sticking together. Reaching the save point just outside Starkweather's huge hedge garden, Cerberus goons are everywhere, with snipers locking down the main path to his mansion. And holy shit, it took me forever to figure out a way through this place. This area is big and confusing to get through, with the path you're supposed to take to reach the side of his mansion not very obvious. That's on top of all the guards and the lack of any weapons we can use for silent executions. So we're stuck loudly shooting these guys and bringing all his friends to our location. You need to take a left from where you found the save point, past the large cross and the guards there until you find a set of stairs leading to a path below. You'll now be in a separate, circular hedge maze, which is filled with more guards. But if you survive and reach the center of the maze, you'll find the next save point. From here, you'll see another set of stairs leading up to Starkweather's mansion. And if you're careful enough, you can avoid being spotted as you reach the building. Now, to actually get inside the place, you need to reach the cellar. The entrance of which is on the opposite side of the mansion. With several guards walking around on the way there, along with the two snipers from before watching from above. There's probably a more intelligent and simple way to get through this ordeal, but what I ended up doing was going down this hallway, up the stairs, killing the snipers, then hiding and picking off every guard who came upstairs to investigate. After they stopped showing up, I went back downstairs and found only one guard still walking around. So I took care of him and ran for my life, finally reaching the cellar. The fun is far from over though, as Starkweather has taken more precautions to protect himself from Cash and presumably Pigsy. First, he shut off the power to his personal elevator, and second, the leader of Cerberus is in possession of the key that unlocks that elevator. So we'll need to head to the basement to turn on the power and track down the leader to get the key. 
Entering the mansion, we're unable to go down certain hallways, as we'll get spotted on security cameras and Cerberus goons will rush to our location. I can shoot and destroy them, but the same thing will happen if I don't find a place to hide. So for this opening segment, I take the long way around the mansion, picking off guards, hiding and proceeding when possible. Eventually I find this large area with a huge staircase and where the save point is located. Taking the stairs up and around will lead to the Cerberus leader's location, along with the hallway to Starkweather's elevator. But if I take the door on the left, I'll find the stairs leading down into the basement. So I do that instead. Grabbing some conveniently placed wire, I strangle the guard at the entrance to the basement and hide his body in the shadows. Huh, I guess I did end up using this mechanic after all. Running down the left hallway, I enter a room, blow the lock, turn on the power, and hit the save point. Heading upstairs, I can pick up the guards wandering outside the leader's position, but he and the guys he has with him will refuse to leave the room. So I open the door, picked a few of them off, ran away to find some painkillers to get back to 100%, and then came back to run in and finish them off. I looked up a guide afterwards to see if there was a better way, and I guess not, because the guy who wrote it pretty much suggested the same strategy. Oh well, as long as it works, right? Alrighty, now that I'm on the elevator, nothing can stop me from getting to Starkweather. Ah shit, I was hoping Cerberus would take care of him. Despite his size, Pigsy is deceptively fast, which may explain why Cerberus was having so much trouble with him. Also, unlike every other enemy in the game, you won't hear him coming either, as this fat bastard would more or less teleport out of nowhere after you round a corner or enter a doorway. Since Cash dropped all his guns on the elevator, I guess, you now have to search the area for something to hurt him with. Unfortunately, all you get is three shards of glass, all spread out very far from each other. So the way this boss fight plays out is searching your surroundings for a weapon, running for your life if Pigsy shows up, making sure to break line of sight with him before hiding, and then stabbing him when the opportunity presents itself. He'll run off and then you'll have to do it two more times. It's a very tense standoff, not helped by the fact he can kill you in seconds with his chainsaw especially if you make a wrong turn and enter a room too small to run past him. No Once you've shanked him three times, he'll chop through a locked door and hide up in the attic. On the opposite side of the attic is a path that connects to a stairwell leading up to Starkweather's office and this is where you get creative. As you have to get Pigsy's attention, run up the stairs, and walk him over this metal netting where it starts to buckle under his weight, causing him to run off. Go back down, and get him to chase you one last time, and then let gravity do its thing. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Alright then, time to put an end to Starkweather. Send him to hell! Go on! Oh come on, seriously? More Cerberus goons? Alright, fine. After leading a few of those chuckleheads down below, killing them and taking their guns, I head back up the stairs, carefully pick off the last two guards, and then use my trusty chainsaw to bust through the door. Starkweather can still kill you though if he gets off enough shots before you reach him, but once you're in range, rev up that chainsaw and put an end to that bastard. Oh! 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 Cash, I made you! Acclaimed movie maker Lionel Starkweather has been found dead today.
along with several of his bodyguards, at his estate at the Wapona Hills Residential District. In what investigators are calling a bloody vendetta, an unknown assailant infiltrated the compound, killing Starkweather, but more interestingly, leading police to the site of a snuff film ring being run from the estate's confines. Linked to this ring is Carcer City's own police chief, Gary Schaefer, whose lawyer stated that he intends to plead not guilty. And that was Manhunt. Like the Warriors, I really enjoyed my time with it and understand why it's such a big hit. It was the complete opposite of the more popular Grand Theft Auto series, forcing you to play it slowly, to plan ahead, and almost constantly making you feel like the odds were stacked against you. Its dirty and dark set pieces create this oppressing and intense atmosphere. Its stealth gameplay was solid and never felt cheap or unfair. Anytime I was spotted or got killed, it was completely on me. And not because of some broken mechanics causing enemies to see through a wall or something. That said, with 20 years having passed since its release, it can feel a little outdated. As outside the heavier action segments, executions can lose their impact a few hours in game even with the different weapons. If the game got a modern remake, outside of the more realistic and gorier kills you could get with modern graphics, maybe it could add something like environmental kills. Think the Punisher game where Frank can lead criminals to certain spots for a unique interrogation and kill. So instead of just stabbing some guy in the back of the neck a hundred times, you could push him into an oven, or down a pit ball of spikes, or into a shark tank. If we're going for a gruesome spectacle, let's push the boundaries even further. From there, I think I would have liked it if the gangs differentiated more from each other, outside their clothing and what they say. For example, the war dogs being militaristic survivalists. What if they incorporated that mentality into their stage and tactics? Like they rig certain doorways with a tripwire, and you have to either figure out a way around it or disarm it without blowing yourself up. Or they set up a rope trap you have to avoid, or else become a sitting duck while hanging from a tree. I don't know, just ideas I'm spitballing. I've never played Manhunt 2, so for all I know, some of these ideas pop up in there. To sum up my thoughts, Manhunt was a brutal, tense, and challenging experience. An experience that was pretty humbling for me, as a lot of my difficulty with the game just came down to playing it too safe, or being unable to think outside the box to better use the tools at my disposal. I can't really think of another game that manages to balance its violence in a way where you still feel like you're struggling to survive as opposed to your usual power fantasy. I pretty much say this at the end of every video covering a non-GTA Rockstar game, but I would love it if this series made a comeback. Considering the advancements in gameplay within the stealth genre, and the increasing popularity of horror games that emphasize vulnerability and constantly running away, like Outlast for example, a modern manhunt holds immense potential. It could deliver an experience that's both terrifying and intensely violent surpassing its predecessor in every aspect. Like the Warriors, I'm skipping the usual outro. Sorry for the delay on this one, guys. I know I said I was going to do it back to back, but I kept running into hiccups during the editing process. I'll announce the next video soon. And don't forget, GTA 5 video next month. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.